All right, so welcome to conservation biology. <clears throat> conservation biology is in the, the field of science a fairly young field. It's something that we've been working on 80, 90 years here. So compared to other fields like anatomy and physiology and chemistry, it's, it's relatively new. So there's a lot of things that we're still sorting out and trying to understand and figure out in regards to conservation. We have lots of great examples, lots of models, and massive amounts of data to support this field. But sometimes people are not as supportive of it because, well, we're not sure 100% with some of the ideas or hypothesis that we're proposing. But as technology changes, as new information is presented, we continue to strengthen the field of conservation biology. So what conservation biology is, is a field of science, primarily we say life science, that looks to balance the needs of humans against 1.8 million other species. Okay, so how do we balance our needs, the needs of one species against 1.8 million? others and making sure we manage our planet with the idea that we will have resources for future generations so there's a lot of challenges here in front of us with conservation biology and we'll get into some of those challenges and talk about little things all of us can do that will support conservation biology and believe it or not there's a lot of things we can do that are actually financially beneficial that also support conservation biology. So conservation biology takes information from all sorts of different disciplines, from different fields of biology, chemistry, physics, sociology, psychology, environmental stuff, law and policy, and it blends all this stuff together to help us make educated decisions based on data, science, and information. So we try not to make decisions based on just passion and desire, but actually based on science and based on here are the facts, here's the information, here's what we can see and what we can test and we can do. So um, we say as we go through this lecture, we want to approach it from that scientific perspective, but look at how do we balance these issues out, the needs of one population, one species against 1.8 million others. And if we go back to the earlier ecology information, we've got to keep in mind every species is connected. So we can't over support ourselves at the cost of other species because then it will eventually cost us dramatically or significantly. Okay, so a concern we have with conservation is that species diversity is crashing. It's, it's very frightening how many species are de our populations are either decreasing or they're going extinct and that's a bad bad issue so we can expect in our lifetimes we can expect 10 to 20 percent of the species on earth to go extinct within the next 20 to 30 years. So easily within our lifetimes, we will see hundreds and thousands of species go extinct. So let that sink in for a minute. You know, what happens when those blocks disappear out of that tower we talked about, the Chinga Tower, the Tower of Blocks? Take 10% of the blocks out. You say, oh, well, that's only 180,000 species. 180,000 species. Consider the ripple effect. How will that impact the food chain, the food web, species st or community stability, community diversity? That's a huge issue. That's something that all of us should be paying attention to, but it gets very, very little public notice. We tend to ignore this issue and focus on other things. But this issue will create significant problems for the human species in the it's causing problems now and it will continue to create problems in the future. 
So when we're approaching conservation, what we look to do is find regions that are the most important and say we need to direct as much of our energy and as many resources as possible into these regions in order to save the greatest biodiversity possible. So the reality is we can't save everything. It's not practical, not feasible, not realistic. But what can we save? And the areas we should save or put on the top of the priority list are called hotspots. So a hotspot is a region of Earth that contains, oh, did I spell right? that contains the greatest amount of biodiversity. So if you go into a rainforest and you count the different plants and animals and you come up with a number, <clears throat> I'll make one up, 372,000. And then you go into a prairie and you count the number of plants and animals and you get 17,800. And you have to make a choice between the rainforest and the prairie and you can only save one you should be saving the rainforest. You should be saving the regions of Earth that have the greater amount of biodiversity. Those are <clears throat> more important to save than the areas with lower biodiversity. It's not that we don't want to save the prairie in the areas of lower bi biodiversity, but in the big picture, if we can only save one, you save the one that has the most biodiversity. So our challenge, though, if you look at these regions of biodiversity, go across the globe and look at where these are, what we call the biodiversity hotspots, these black spots here. These are all regions that have incredibly large human populations and will continue to see major human population growth. The mega diversity countries are the countries that are second to the hotspots. So it would be second in priority they're in the same regions as the hotspots. These are all tropical equatorial regions. So you consider those biomes. The biomes within the equatorial regions are tropical biomes. Greatest producer productivity, largest producer base, the most biodiversity in those brackets there. So if we're develop or we're putting resources towards conservation, that's more important for global conservation issues than saving anything in North America, anything in Europe, most of Africa, where it's a desert, go up into Asia, etc. Now, I'm not saying we don't want to do conservation in the U.S. I think it's absolutely critical, and we should. But we have to look at the global picture and go, where do we put as many of our resources as possible? Those regions. This is why we have such a big challenge with conservation, trying to convince people to save regions that are not even in their backyard. So why, do, why should I care about rainforests in Central America? Because that rainforest produces the oxygen we breathe. Illinois doesn't make oxygen year-round. It makes it for about four or five months, and then we're done making oxygen in Illinois because everything goes dormant. Yet we breathe the entire year. That oxygen is coming from the ocean, and it's coming from the rainforest. So if we screw the rainforest up, we lose a source of oxygen. It decreases global oxygen levels. So these are the big pictures that conservation tries to educate people on and get people to see. So most of the time, when we look at hot spots, people often go, Ugh, they're dirty, they're nasty, they're, they're worthless. You know, what's the value of something like a swamp? What's the value of a mangrove forest? What's the value of you know, these other estuaries, etc.? These are not nice, neat, pretty areas. Why should we care about these? So they're often viewed as having very little value. And most of the time when we look at value and we talk about value, it's how much is it worth? What's the dollar amount? And most of those hot spots are not viewed as having value. So I have, oh, 600 acres of swampland. I can't do anything with that. It's, it's, it's just nasty. So people buy it cheap. And then they change it. They convert it. They drain it. 
They build retirement communities in that former swamp. And then they make a lot of money off of it. But is it more important to have kept it as a swamp? So those are the issues. When you take a hot spot and you drain it or you destroy it, you knock it down and you alter it, you've lost a major amount of biodiversity. You've gotten a financial gain, which to some extent that's a good thing for people. But what is the ultimate cost when you've lost this biodiversity? So we talk about value. And a lot of times we start with what is the direct value? This is the dollar amount that can be put on something. Okay, how much money can I make from it? You know, what's my dollar amount? Different things have medicinal value. This is a three billion dollar per year industry in the United States, the medicinal value of things. Think about the pharmaceutical industry. How much money does that industry make? They place huge value on things because they can make money off of it through pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry. Most of our medicines were originally discovered or derived from rainforest products, rainforest plants. We're finding things on the coral reef that we can use as medicines. We're using extractions from venomous snakes to help work with surgery. So there's incredible medicinal value to species. And if we lose those species, what have we lost? We've lost billions of dollars of revenue for our country, for people, for... But more importantly, we've lost cures for diseases. So we will often find pharmaceutical companies are actually buying thousands of acres of land in the rainforest and conserving it to research, to study, to see if there are new cures for diseases sitting out there. So that is one way we use, we look at something, does it have a direct value in the medicinal or pharmaceutical industry? We also look at, does it have an agricultural value? Think about Illinois. Our, the majority of our economy is based on agriculture, corn and soybeans primarily. So what is the agricultural value of that particular community? You know, how many cornfields have been turned into subdivisions? So we weigh it out. What's the agricultural value versus the developmental value? Good black farm ground, twelve, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 an acre. There's a huge value there. That's a direct value. You can look at that farm ground and put a dollar tag on it and say this is the value of that particular piece of ground. So we, you know, we associate dollars to it. Uh, consumptive value. Can I eat it? If I can eat it, then there's money that can be made from it. So can I catch these fish? Can I harvest fish? Can I catch crabs and lobsters and all sorts of things that we consume? What is the dollar value associated with food or things that we can consume? If there's no consumptive value, we don't. why should we keep the species around? But these values also play a role in sometimes the decline of the species. Because if we overvalue it and we overconsume it, then we push the species closer to extinction. So we always look at values and we all have to weigh them out individually and as a society which values are the most important to us direct values are definitely important because that's what sustains our economy enables people to have the resources and things they want but here comes the challenge when you're talking to somebody in a hot spot and you tell them don't cut down your rainforest because we need the oxygen in illinois and they look at you and say but I need to make money to pay for my children's food, my education for my family, health care, roads, hospitals. They put a direct value on that rainforest. Now, how can we tell them not to use that direct value to improve their lives? That becomes a great challenge. So we are trying to have them look at the indirect value and weigh that out heavier than the direct value. So in the next lecture, we'll start talking about the indirect values of ecosystems.